morning. And good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone that's here. Glad you could be with us this morning. I hope you've had a blessed morning so far, and uh, I hope you're looking forward to what God's going to do for you today, and because He's got plans for you today, and He's got a word for you to hear, and we just have to take it and use it and apply it to our lives. So we're glad you are here to come and worship with us today. Just a couple of quick things. Don't forget this afternoon, uh, we will have our trunk or treat uh, beginning at 5, and uh, we will have soup and chili fellowship to go along with that uh, this afternoon. So I encourage you all to come back. If you don't want to get a treat out of a car, you can at least come and sit down and eat and fellowship with us. We'd love to have you to come be a part of that and fellowship with us. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's one correction that has to be made on here. Um, if you don't set your clocks back, if you wait till the 12th, I think you're going to be, you, you don't set your clock too wrong. It's the Sunday before that. So, um, whatever that date is. Fifth? Okay. Fourth? Yeah, it's the Sunday before the 12th that's on here. Um, so that's your time to change your clocks, fall back. And, um, and then on that Monday night on the 6th, it'll be giggles at 7 o'clock. Are y'all going to do anything at 6? Um, also on the shoebox packing that, that November the 8th on that Wednesday night, uh, which will be also our business meeting night. If you're not finished, if you're not finished okay. Um, if you've been pulling up and you're noticing there's, there's some work being done back here. Um, I see some is already getting their, their scenes up for the uh, drive through And so um, we see progress, and that, that's, that's encouraging, and so we're thankful for that. And others, uh, if you need help, let us know, and we'll be glad to, to help. Just one quick little note, though. Before you fasten it down to the ground, just check with us. Make sure we, get, we may have to tweak it just a little bit to line it up to the road as we come through. So, um, so just make sure we, can, we do that before we fasten it down to the ground so it don't blow away. Um, so we look forward with that. So that's coming up. And uh, I don't know about y'all, but I have mentioned it to people at work and other places, and they, they're like, really? Let me know what days. Let me know times, because they're, they're interested in coming. So uh, so great thing going on. So, um, Anything else? Are you glad to be here this morning? Amen. Are you really glad to be here this morning? Amen. All right, well, let's just worship and praise the Lord. And and uh, listen, you know, if you want to shout like you did at the ball game yesterday or Friday night, that's fine. Shout to the Lord. Give him praise and worship. Raise your hands like because you, like, you scored a touchdown when you were born again. And, uh, and receive that great gift of salvation. So uh, just give him praise today and let's just worship him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You going to pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity this morning you've given us to be in your house of worship. Fathers, we come to assemble ourselves together as one body in Christ. Lord, we assemble in this place to just come and give you praise and worship. Father, the praise and worship that you deserve. Lord, as we come and lift our hands toward heaven and lift our voices up to you in praise, Father, just ask for the anointing of your spirit to come and dwell in this place today, Lord. Let it move in our hearts and in our lives in a mighty way today. Father, let it open our eyes to see, Father, where we need to be drawn closer to you. And, and Lord, let it just reveal yourself to us more and more at every word and every song that is sung as we praise your holy name. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, as we're just able to come and give you praise today. And Lord, just ask for all your presence to just uh, anoint us in a special way. Now give us all the ears today, Lord, to hear what your spirit has to say. For it's in Jesus' sweet and holy and righteous name I pray. Amen and amen.
can I go to the rock? Would you stand? Let's sing together. Let's worship together. Hymn number 30. Come. Now is the time to worship. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the Southern Baptist Association sets aside October as a month that we recognize pastors. And uh, since October's about gone, we decided it might be time to recognize our pastor this year. <laughs> In August the 2nd of uh, 2009, Brother Kerry 
or we ask Brother Kerry to come and deliver a sermon. And we ex issued a call to Brother Kerry at that time. And on August the 23rd of 2009, he took over the pulpit. And he's been with us all these years. I don't know what the average span is for a Baptist preacher in rural churches now. The last I heard it was around 18 months to two years. It may have changed some. With Brother Kerry staying here this length of time, maybe that going a little bit higher. But at this time, uh, we're not giving him a big fanfare, balloons, and all that appreciation day. But we do appreciate Brother Kerry, I do. At this point, if anyone has anything they'd like to say to Brother Kerry, now's your opportunity before the, before the congregation. And if you don't care to say something now, or if you have a card for him, if you don't want to you can give it to him at a later time and tell him how much you appreciate him being here. Now, on behalf of the Walker family, I truly appreciate you, what you've done under God's leadership here. I'm looking forward to many, many more years of your service here. As long as God directs you here, you always follow his direction. Does anyone have anything they'd like to say? Anyone else? I'm sorry, I did not see. I'm sorry. Anyone else? Thank you. Brother Kerry, we started back here about a year ago. Uh, it was pretty hard to move from the church. I'd been here for about 35 years. But uh, it really helped. I think you glorify God in your son. Uh, the nation of Kerry just made us feel like we were just in a Anyone else? Someone else? Brother Kerry, we appreciate you for blessing your whole family, and we just thank you for what you've done, and we look forward to many things ahead that you I'll say he's always, 
he has been there for our family. Um, and all of my crazy ideas sometimes that I come up with, uh, and Kay, we just kind of say, what do you think about that? We, we really kind of have it planned out. We just need his approval. He always goes back. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> and Vanessa, thank you for what you do, too. Someone else. That's all I got to say right here. That's all I got to say. Love you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> said we didn't plan anything big fanfare uh, that's because it was up to maybe the deacons and sometimes we may not follow up some of them may not even know about it uh, we probably don't follow through as a deacon group like the giggles on planning stuff and being a big fanfare but uh, we're going to take part of this day and we, there is a eating tonight and we're just going to slide that as a part of pastor appreciation <laughs> Brother Terry, I have to thank our church. We appreciate you. Appreciate you. Everything you do. Thank you. Speech. Thank you, speech. Um, you know, I, I would have never dreamed in, in August we'd have celebrated 14 years here. And y'all seen us at our high and you've seen us at our low. Um, and you've seen me pass out here in front of the church. I mean, you've seen a lot of stuff. You've seen her pass out in the pew. So. And I got to think about that the other day, and it seems like every time somebody's praying, we always pass out. So, um, Blake passed out at Hell's Chapel when I was praying. She passed out here when I was praying. Charles, was, I passed out when Charles was praying. So I don't know what it is about prayer. But, um, but I am very thankful because y'all, you, you, are, you are a very, very big part of my family, um, my church family, more than just a church family. You're, you're, you're part of our family. Um, and it's something like Britley said. I, I, I'll never unless it's something I see that is just not a spiritual guidance. Uh, it's not spiritual led. I'll never tell you not to move forward and do something that you felt led to do. Um, if I see that it's spiritual, that it's that it's going to win souls, it's going to touch hearts. I'm going to say go for it because that's what I want you to do. I want you to come up with ideas, and that's why I'm used to be guided. And as long as I see it spiritual. Um, you know, this drive through nativity. I mean, I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, okay, Lord, how's this going to work? Lord, how's this going to work? <laughs> but it's, but it's, everything's, all the pieces are falling in place. You know, and it's just, uh, you know, I don't know what to expect that night. Hey, church, I did not, I didn't know that, I didn't know the first night of ABS this year would expect what we had. You know, I, I'd have thought, grace, you know, if we'd have just got 150 that first night, I'd have been, Lord, but they come and told me how I many we had. I'm like, are you sure we count those numbers? It just, it, I mean, when you open your heart and say, Lord, I want to serve you and just trust in the Lord and everything, that's the only thing I ask and want to do. Um, I will say, Dave, I appreciate y'all. I was picking with the Saul and, and Dave earlier because they're up here on the front pew now. I, I asked the Saul and Tor, did they get kicked off their pew back there? <laughs> um, but no, he said the girls wanted to be up here closer so that where they could see. But I appreciate them, what they've been here, and uh, what he brings and from his culture and his life to share with us and um, to understand his testimony and how God can change their hearts and their lives and the, life and the, and the religion that they, they're raised in. Um, and it can also help you and I, when we go out here in this world, to be able to reach others um, in their lifestyle they're living in. So, um, so I appreciate it. It's all for being here as long as I have been, and, and we continue to pray for them and when they go back. So, but as my heart, thank y'all for all that you do. Um, you know, it's you see so much going on in so many different lives, and it's hard to be there for everybody. But my heart, my heart's always praying for y'all, no matter what you're going through. I'm, all, I'm always lifting you up in prayer. Um, you may not realize it, but I am. I promise you. And I couldn't do all of this without her and I am very appreciative God put her in my life and um because <laughs> me and her both would have looked back 30 years ago and thought we'd have never been in this in this area 
do that he's doing, he's ministering and serving God this way. And, and then you look back on your life and see how God's direct folks of your past and put you together and what you're doing. And, and for her to know that God's called me into the ministry before I even told her God's called me into the ministry, that still blows my mind to this day. And I tell people all, all the time, I said, she knew as soon as I told her that God's called me into the ministry. She, well, she told me God's called you into the ministry before I can even tell her. You know, so me and her both were like scared to death. We didn't know what God had in store. So. But if you open your hearts, if anything I can leave you with this, if you open your hearts and trust the Lord in all things, He will bless you. And it may not be the way you want to be blessed, but He will bless you spiritually in His will. And I promise you that. Again, thank you. I love each and every one of y'all. Um, every one of y'all is visiting. Just here today. This is a loving church family. It may not seem like it always, but we're, we're all human, right? Mm -hmm. you, you and your spouse, you and your children don't, don't always get along, but you still love each other. But I promise you, this is a loving family. So if you were looking for a church you want to be a part of, this is a loving family. God bless y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. And he is easy to work with. Would you stand for our offertory hymn number 255 at the cross?
your blessings on these house and offering that you bring before you now. We pray these things in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Like.
coats and walked out? We hadn't forgot about them, their anniversary. So when both of them get here on the same Sunday, we're going to honor it. I know. Because Kenley's been busy the last couple Sundays. So. But when we got talking about anniversaries, I got looking. I got new Kenley had left, and I'm like, well, we got to get there sometime. So we'll get maybe we'll get them one Sunday here quickly. So. How many of y'all have ever? Well, let me I'll, let me just share my story with y'all. Then you maybe it'll bring memories back to you. I remember growing up as a little boy that when I was out in the garden with my grandparents. I'd love to try to stay in their footsteps. Y'all ever done that? And you always try to do what they did, or, or your parents, you try to do what they did. So now let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been told you either act like your mama or your dad? You just like your mama, you just like your dad. Anybody you been told that before? What does that mean? That you're imitating them, Right? You're acting just like them. So are you imitating them? So today's message, we're going to look at sort of imitating. Because there's a credibility that you and I have to have as disciples. Many people today are skeptical of the church because they perceived us as hypocrites. Right? How many times have you ever heard somebody say, I'm not going to go to that church with all that bunch of hypocrites. Why? Why should they perceive us as hypocrites? Or why do they perceive? Well, one reason is because what they're seeing out there is not what we're portraying in here. And so we're going to look at imitating. So how do we obtain the credibility in our witness to, to others? And how do we do not perceive from others that we, were, we are hypocrites so we can be an effective witness? The answer is simple. You and I must walk in Christ to possess the credibility that we need. Understand that. Listen again. You and I must walk in Christ to possess the credibility that we need. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I want to look at Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. And during this writing, uh, we, you'll find that he's been, he's been in prison, or he's in prison, in writing his letter. Uh, you'll pick that up in, in chapter 4, and we're going, to, we're going to fall back to chapter 4 a little bit. I didn't tell Scott yesterday when he asked me what I was going to be reading from. But we're going to go back to first to chapter 4 too because I'm going to, I've sort of changed some things up on the way I want to approach this today. So, But if you would, please stand in reverence of reading God's Word as we look at Ephesians chapter 5. I want to begin in verse 1. And the gospel says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But for fornicators in all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be, be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater or has any, inheritance, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Most gracious fathers, we come this morning. We ask you, Lord, for your guidance. I ask for your hands to be upon me this morning to speak the only the words that you would have me to speak. That the anointing of your spirit will flow through this tongue and this, these lips and that your anointing of your words will come forth for all our ears to hear. Father, I ask you to have thy way today and let your message, let your gospel words speak to our hearts. That, Father, we imitate you, Lord, in the way that you've designed us to be. 
that, Father, we walk in your ways and we're trusting and le- being led by you through everything that we do. So, Father, we ask you to have that way now. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So the four questions I have been asking over the last few weeks and months, when we look at these word, these passages, these scriptures, so we have to identify the learning opportunities that we have. So what learning opportunities can you learn today out of today's message that it does an inward transformation in your life? That we can recognize the outward practices that it must do. Meaning when we recognize the importance of God's Word and we take that Word into our hearts and into our lives that it makes a transformation within us that it becomes an outward practice that we're doing. And then if you don't understand and if you need to have have more understanding of it then we have to do what? We have to ask. Ask questions. If we're going to talk the talk of Christ... If we're going to talk about being Christians, if we're going to talk about that we attend so-and-so church, or we're going to talk about the live drive through nativity scene, or we're going to talk about all the events we got going on, then we must walk the walk. And I think one reason so many churches or churches today from the outside world you, and, and we hear this, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to go sit with that bunch of hypocrites down there. What are they, what are they receiving from our outward practices, our outward appearances that we're showing? If we come in and we're receiving all these things, what are we, what are we showing out there to the world? So as we've been on this discussion of the importance of me be, and making sure we are being discipled and making disciples and we go back to the Great Commission that Jesus commissioned in Matthew chapter 28 when He commanded us to go out and teach all nations, to observe all teachings. And the essence of those who follow Christ as His disciples are expected to make other disciples. We're to invest our time in other people's lives. And I talked about this last Sunday. I want to encourage you to find one person in your life to invest your time in. That may be a friend, that may be a family member, that might be the neighbor, or someone that you can invest your time in. I'm not asking you to go out and save the world. I'm asking you to go out and save one lost soul that you can invest your time in. And what can you do in that person's life to be a difference to them that they see Jesus through you? And so we are to invest in in, in lives by sharing the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And as I pondered on the responsibilities of discipleship, and I realized that one, one must gain, first of all, we must gain the trust of other people. We must gain the trust of other people. And so sometimes you just can't go out there and, and y'all, I've told y'all this before, and when you're out there visiting, and you know, this, this person you're going to visit is a farmer. And usually he's going to wear farming clothes, right? You know, the, the older people used to wear overalls. Or now they blue jeans and T-shirts, whatever. But you know, they're, they're, they're farming people. So you're not, you're not expecting them to be in a three-piece suit. So why don't we show up in a three-piece suit? We go as they are to communicate with them, to talk with them. They have to build, we, have to, they, we have to build trust in them before we can do anything else. They've got to know that they can trust on us to call on us. And so in order to be great disciples, in order to reach lost souls, we must gain the trust of others so we can be effective disciples. As I was going through this, God just took me all the way back to the beginning of chapter 4, and I want to share with you the importance of what Paul is saying. Because beginning in verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore. Now what, what Paul is, is talking about, there's some things that he says, I, I, I'm telling you something beforehand, and now, now that I've told you this, therefore, he tells us to be imitators of God. 
Meaning we have to imitate them. I think sometimes when people... I, I, I attended a memorial service yesterday of our nurse that, that I told you a couple of weeks ago we lost, and, and her husband was, was telling me, was introducing me to all the family, and, and he said, this is her daughter, and when I looked at it, I'm like, I mean, you see the resemblance, you know? And so when people look in our lives, do they see Jesus in us? Do they see the resemblance of, of Christ that we're living it every day? And so what, what, what Paul's talking about, be imitators of God as dear children. As a child of God, people should be able to look at you and tell you are a child of the King of the Most High. They ought to be able to look in your life and see that you are a child. I can see the resemblance in you. I can see the difference that you make. And so here's what Paul goes on in, back in, in the first part of chapter 4. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now we identify that Paul's in prison. He's in Rome. He's, he's in prison at this time. He's a prisoner of the Lord. He's in prison because he was serving God and, and telling people about Christ. He was willing to take the fall for the, for the glory of God, and he was willing to go to prison. And so the first step that you and I have to think about, are we willing to go all the way, no matter what the cost is in our life, to serve God? If that's being put behind closed bars or is that kneeling down with a gun pointed to our head to identify Jesus as our Lord and Savior, are we willing to go all the way? And that's what Paul is saying. I'll, I'm in prison. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, he begs us, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. Now, what Paul is telling you and me this, this morning is, if we're going to be disciples, then we've got to walk the walk that we talk. It's one thing to talk it. It's one thing to tell people that, that I'm a Christian. It's one thing to tell people that I love Jesus and that I attend Zion Chapel Baptist Church or, or where we're doing this or I'm a Sunday school teacher or I'm a, dis, I'm a deacon or I'm a pastor or whatever. It's one thing to talk it, but are we putting one foot in front of the other one and we're walking it every day in our lives? Are we walking it to the point that people look at us and they know you're a child of the king? Well, how do you know that? Because I can see it all over you. You resemble Jesus. You resemble who he is and the love that he has for others and the love that he wants you to have and, and, and pour out to others. I, I, I told y'all, and I may have shared it this way, I told y'all last Sunday, for some reason, I don't know why, God's just been, I, I, they've been popping up, but I've been getting, getting listened to a lot of Adrian Rogers clips here lately. I don't know why they pop up on my phone. I guess I mentioned his name and you know how these phones are. You mention something, the next thing you know, you're starting to get all this stuff. But he talks about going to church. And he makes this statement, says, Pastor, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And Agent Rogers says, you're absolutely right. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But if you're going to love what Jesus loves and Jesus loves the church, you're going to be in church. Simple enough. I thought, wow. If you, love what, if you love Jesus and you want to love what Jesus loves, Jesus loves the church. And you're going to love people. Well, Paul's going to talk about that too. Because now he gets into the process, not only we're to walk in the worthy of the calling with which we are called, we're born again Christians, we're, we're child of the king, we're child of God, we're to walk worthy of that calling. And he says, with all lowliness. Meaning we're not putting ourselves up there on a pedestal. I had this thought the other day that, that I just said, Lord, I want to be last. I want to be last. Why do I want to be last? Because the Bible says those who are last will be first. I want to be humble enough, Lord, I want to be last. Humble me, Father, so I can be first in your kingdom. We're to be lowliness, meaning we're, we're not to put ourselves above anyone else. We're to, we're to have a spirit of God. And he says not only that with all lowliness, but with gentleness. With gentleness, we love on each other. We love one another with a long suffering, no matter what we're going to bear in life. This is another statement that says, as Christians, you're not going to have prosperity here on this earth. 
You're not going to prosper with riches and wealth and health and everything else. He says long-suffering means you're going to suffer things in life. And as a good soldier in Christ, as soldiers go to battle, and that battle is hard, you and I are going to have struggles and temptations and trials and things in our life that we're going to have to be long-suffering. But here's where the key is. When you're going through those things in life, and when I'm going through those things in life, and he says, with long suffering, he says, bearing with one another in love. You know what that bearing means? Come here, brother. Let me wrap my arms around you. Let me bear with you this burden that you're going with prayer and help load you up. You know... David, I'm, I'm always reminded it. You and Casal, where did Casal go? He's, uh, he's got the baby. What y'all spoke those two time Sundays in, in our brotherhood, I'll never forget those couple statements. Bearing one another right here is when Jesus was walking Peter back to the boat, holding him up while the waves were still crashing upon his life. Bearing one another is when we're going through trials and tribulations in life, people see Jesus in us and they know that they can call on us. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I got people, I got men people in my life right now that I know without a shadow of a doubt, if I call them up right now and says, listen, I just got diagnosed with terminal cancer or terminal illness or something, I can promise you they're going to fall to their knees right there at that moment and start praying. There's people that I can count on that I know for a fact without a shadow of a doubt that they, they're, they, they're bearing one another's burdens because they love them. Jesus bared our burdens that he took them upon the cross for your, for your gift of salvation to take your troubles and your trials and everything you face in life. He bared it upon, him, upon himself because he loves you. And so Paul makes that statement. Bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. I'm telling you something, folks. We as a church family, and as I mentioned earlier about if you're a visitor and you, you want a loving church family, we're family. And you know what? We don't get along all the time. We, we don't get along all the time, do we? We hurt each other's feelings once in a while. But so does, so does your natural family. Your natural family, y'all hurt each other's feelings once in a while. You get upset. The children make you mad. They do something that dis- that's disobedient and you have to get on to them. Does it change your love for them? No. Sometimes it just makes you love them more. Sometimes it just makes you love them more. So we're, we're a loving family. So we're to endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. We're, we're, to, we're to fight to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace in the unity of God as one another. So you ought to strive in your heart, no matter what's facing, to, to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace in our lives. Jump on down to verse 17 with me in chapter 4. Paul then goes on to say, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Paul is stating to everyone right here, I'm testifying to you that in, in my walk, in my love, in my lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, that I love you beyond measure. He says, I'm testifying to you. And I'm telling you the truth. He says that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Let me tell you something, folks. When you're a born-again Christian, I'm not sitting here saying that you're still not going to stumble and fall. But the old man, the old person, is done away with. You are a new creature in Christ. You're a new creation. Paul's going to talk about it in just a minute. There be, ought to be new things in your life. The old things you used to be involved in, the old way you used to live, should be gone, the sinful state. Because you're a new person in Christ. And Paul says, so don't no, don't no longer walk in those ways in the, as the rest of the Gentiles walk. He says, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, 
who being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness, to the work all uncleanness with greediness. He's talking about move from these things that you once were in. There's so much greater and better that he has, in, that he has for you that you're not to walk in the same way. Then drop, jump on down to verse 23. Because then he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is your transformation process. This is the sanctification process. When we're born again, we start being renewed in the spirit of our minds. That we put on this new person that we are in Christ, which was created, listen, which was created according to not you. You didn't create this new creation, this new person. It was created in God. In God, according to God, in the true righteousness and holiness. See, this new life we have in Christ can transform us, sanctification process in our lives to live righteous and holy lives before God. Now, that doesn't mean we aren't going to stumble and fall once in a while. I was coming through the house the other night. All the lights was off. Our dog's dish bowls. They sat on a little wire tra- rack right at our little foyer going into our bedroom. And somehow it, it got slid over just a little ways into our doorway. And so I'm walking through there at night, and I, I catch it on my little toe. And Vanessa says, what? I said, nothing. I just hit the dog bowl, you know. Because sometimes in life, in the darkness of night, we're going to stumble and stomp our toe, and we're going to get hurt. Things are going to happen in life, right? But you know what? God is still there to love us no matter what we face in life. No matter what's going on in life, he's still there to love us. Because why? Because in Christ we are a new person, a new man, he says. That's a new new person in him which was created according to God. If it was created by me and you, it would be all messed up. But because it was created by God, Paul says, with in, in true righteousness. You see, the righteousness that you and I may think we have is nothing compared to what God has designed in our life. And in true holiness of who He is. So the first thing I realize in this, that we must walk as believers in Christ. And we, if we're going to have a credibility about our discipleship, then we must walk in a way that is worthy of our calling. We must walk in Christ. We must imitate Him as we are children of Him. And we are children of God. To walk in His love, as it says, as Paul said there in chapter 5, as Christ also has loved us and He gave Himself to us as an offering and a sacrifice. To God. He goes on the list there, which I read a few minutes ago, all the sinful things of the world, all the sinful things of the flesh that we're, we're to be moved, changed from by the renewing of our minds and our lives that we walk worthy of the calling. So if you and I are going to be great disciples and, and lead others to Christ, then our life has to be... A, 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 a representing of who Christ is in our lives. We must imitate Him daily. And listen, we battle the flesh every day. The flesh has a desire that it wants things in its life, and we battle it every day. And we have to take that captive for the glory of God, for what He wants in our lives, and that our lives are worthy of our walk. So we are to imitate the God we serve. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We're to strive daily to be perfect before God. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2 says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 1 Peter 1, verse 15, But as as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. 
be holy in all manner of conversation. My prayer for me every single day is, Lord, if I'm going to stumble and fall, please, please, Lord, don't let it be in front of nobody. Because I don't want to cause another person to stumble and fall. That's my prayer every day. But Lord, help me to, to be holy for you are holy. Help my words to be, be a manner of conversation to you that is uplifting. May everything I do today, God, be glorifying to you. And Lord, lead me and show me that I may walk worthy of my calling. That I may walk worthy of my calling. So my question in closing this morning, and that ain't even half the notes that I even had. How's your walk? Can someone look in your life right now and say, you're a child of the king. I know who you are. Because see, all of us can go to someone that, we, that knows our family and they will look at us and say, boy, you look just like your mama or just look like your daddy. But how many could truly say in your life right now that you look like the King of kings and the Lord of lords? You see, that's who we need to be imitating. That's, that's who people need to look in our lives and see there's something different. That's about us. You see, when, we, when, you, when you start talking and making this relationship with, with somebody and you're building that, that, that relationship up for them to trust you, they look at your life and, they, and they'll ask this question. There's something different about you. What is it? Because you don't look the same as the world looks. You're, there's something different about you. And you know what God just did for you? He just opened up a door. The door of opportunity. To tell that person is Jesus. Jesus changed my life. I accepted him as my savior. And I've made him lord of my life. And I'm trying my best, best every single day to walk the walk that I need to walk that's worthy of my calling. And be honest with them. To let them know I, st- I struggle every day. I'll be honest with you, I struggle every day. Because we're not perfect. But, when, but the, that's the great thing about the Holy Spirit that God descends upon us, that the Holy Spirit... Brings conviction in our hearts to say, mm, you messed up. And then we just take a moment and say, Lord, I, I, I messed up, Lord. Please forgive me. And he says, son, just keep going. Just keep going. I know it's tough. Keep going. Just keep walking. I don't know where you're at today in your life. I've attended three funerals in the last week. Got a text yesterday morning of a patient that passed, and everybody's like, wow, we didn't see that coming. You see, you and I are not promised our next breath. We're not promised tomorrow. But what we are promised at this moment is a Savior who loves us. And He sacrificed His life for you and me. That we can come to a holy and righteous God and let Him create in us the creature He wants us to be, the person He wants us to be. 
that we can imitate him in our lives. In just a minute, we're going to have communion. That juice represents the shed blood for you and I. That little piece of bread that you're going to take represents the broken body that Jesus had ripped and torn for our sins, our sorrows, our hurts, our pains, our sickness, everything about us. He took upon his own body. K-Mac sent a, sent a little art, little thing this week to me, which I'd already read about it and seen it and heard it. And it talked about the, um, all the utensils and stuff that was in the, in the, uh, tent, of tab- the tent of Tabernacle and where they were placed. And this, this guy found a cave that he was able to crawl up into and he found the mercy seat. Right up under Golgotha. And he said he looked up above, above it and there's dark, the, the, the dirt and the stone underneath, it's real, real dark. Looks like where blood had, had entered into those rocks. And I've always heard the story when Jesus died and his blood fell off of him onto the ground, that it penetrated through the ground and fell on the mercy seat. That the mercy seat, some way, was, over time, was dug and put up under Golgotha. Makes perfect sense. Because in sacrifice time back in the Old Testament, they had to take the blood and, spread it and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat for the forgiveness of sins. He shed his blood upon the mercy seat for forgiveness of your sins to cleanse you of all unrighteousness so you can stand before a righteous and a holy God. And we talked about choices means denied. So right now God's giving you, that's, that's, the, that's the one great, probably greatest gift God's ever, other than Jesus, he's given you and I all the free choice. Free choice. Your choice right now today it's accept him as Lord and Savior or reject him. That's your choice. It's your free will. But I can tell you this. If you reject him and you should die today, there's a total damnation awaiting for you. Totally separated from the Father forever and ever. But as Christians, there's also a judgment coming upon you too. You see, there's another book that's going to be opened up. And it's the book of the righteous. And it's going to be read, every name and all the things you've done for the glory of the kingdom. And that's where you receive your crown. And the jewels on your crown to stand before the Father. Us too, as Christians, are going to be judged according of our works as a Christian. And our servant. Now we won't be told to be, depart from me, but we will be judged according to our works. So if you want a crown of rubies, just then let's walk the walk, not just talk it. And let's lead others to Christ. Let's be disciples and make disciples. So whatever your decision, your choice is today, God's laid it out before you. This is the day that Lord has made for you to say, I surrender to you, Lord. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it's just a simple message of your word. Father, I know life on this earth is not easy. Father, I know there's temptations that we're, we're pulled into. We know this flesh desires fleshly things that are not of you. So, Father, we just ask you to have a way right now. Let your spirit speak to us in a mighty way. Let it move in our lives. Let it direct us to do, make the decisions that we need to make this morning. So, Father, whatever decisions, Lord, we don't put them off to tomorrow. Because you're not promised us tomorrow. Tomorrow will not come until you tell it, tell it to So, Father, we ask you to have thy way now in each and every life that's here, each and every soul. Have thy way. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. As we all stand. Thank you.